Uh, the final topic under uh, you know, image enhancement is uh, illumination compensation. Is illumination compensation. Okay. What this really means is that, right, if you have an image wherein the illumination is not uniform, okay, in the sense that you could have a light source that is probably, you know, shining from somewhere from the top, right, to the shining down, okay, on this, and therefore, right, it creates a gradient, it creates an illumination gradient, wherein, let's say, these pixels that are actually closer to the light source are brighter, and then the pixels that are farther off, right, are, are kind of relatively darker. So the idea is that how do you really do an illumination composition? This, is a, this again comes under enhancement because this is one way to enhance the visual appeal of an image. Okay, in the sense that uh, you know, we don't like to see an image that has a gradient, okay, illumination gradient that has been artificially created by the source right, because of the way the source has been placed. Okay, therefore the idea is that you know can you kind of can you kind of uh, you know. Uh, can you kind of uh, do a compensation, right? Such that, such that the output image, okay, will have a, will have an illumination that looks uniform. It would like to go from what is a non-uniform illumination, right? So such an illumination is called non-uniform illumination. We would like to go from from a situation that has non-uniform illumination to an image that would uh, and then kind of transform this image so that uh, the illumination in the output image looks like looks looks uniform. Okay, and uh, and uh, one of the ways, right, in which to do this is what is called a homomorphic filtering. Okay, I'll talk about I'll talk about what is called as homomorphic filtering. Okay, homomorphic filtering. Okay, this is uh, this this kind of a uh, homomorph homomorphic in the sense that there's some kind of cell similarity inside the approach, right, that I will talk about. Now, now the idea is that, right, an, an image affected by illumination, an image affected by illumination, an image affected by illumination can be modeled. Yes, I'll tell you why it can be modeled as f of x comma y okay this is your this image that is affected by some illumination gradient is r times x comma y into i of x comma y okay what this really means is that ideally right r of x comma y is the kind of true true irradiance or true true right uh, true true intensities right so basically this is the this is the true image I mean, that you would have liked to see okay this is the true image that you would have liked to see Okay, unfortunately, right? That has been that has been uh, that has been affected. Okay, by this by this uh, this illumination component, and therefore the final f of x y, right, which you have, okay, you know, is is no longer uniform in you know, illumination. Now this is also in you know, sometimes referred to as the say, a reflectance component, and uh, this one is referred to as the as, you know illumination component. Okay. Now, ideally, I of x y should have been one or simply a constant for all intensities, but in this case, right, it is not. Okay, normally, right, it is not. Okay, I mean, if it was a constant, then of course you would have had you know, uniform illumination. But then, but then, when it is not, right, then you get what is called a non-uniformly illuminated image. Now, the way it works is that you know it assumes that this is a slowly varying component. Okay, this is a slowly varying. This is slowly varying, okay, which is which is a reasonable thing to assume because in an image, right, like I showed in the earlier picture, when you have this illumination that is shining from one side, right, you would expect expect that this illumination would would kind of slowly change, right, as you traverse across the image. You don't expect any sudden sudden variations, whereas the reflectance, right, is typically a fast varying, typically fast varying, right, because the because uh, for example, right, when I mean, you could have when I mean, the underlying Underlying scene intensities, right? Could be, could be really rapidly varying. Okay, depends upon the material characteristics. Depends upon, right? Depends upon what is called its own albedo and so on. And uh, and then, right? You know, typically there's no reason to believe that uh, that you should have a reflectance, right? That 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 would not that would not be, uh, no. That um, so 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 it's normal to assume that uh, that your uh, that your reflectance uh, reflectance is fast varying. Okay, now. 
if you come back here right so what this really means is that now uh, now because of the fact that this is a product right of course I mean you like to do some kind of a processing on F right, in order to be able to remove the effect of illumination you may not be able to completely remove it but then you would like to see decrease its effect right uh, what, what is called as you know, ameliorating the effect of the you know, changing illumination now uh, now, what is done is the following, right? Because of the fact that there's a product, right? You would, uh, you cannot directly apply Fourier transforms, right? Because uh, you could apply, but then, right? It won't really lead to anything meaningful. Uh, instead, what is done is you apply the apply the natural raw logarithm on on both sides of that equation. So you end up getting log of f of x y, right? And you end up getting log of f of x y is equal to ln of uh, r of x y plus ln of i of x y. Right. Okay. This is what this is what it will, it will amount to after you apply after you take the take the natural logarithm on both sides. Now let's call this as z of x y. Okay. Now that now that right you've been able to convert the product into an addition. Okay. Let us take the Fourier transform, taking the Fourier transform of both sides, on both sides will give you something like let's call the after taking the Fourier transform let's call this as z of u comma v okay or let me let me kind of write this as okay so we'll let's write this as Fourier transform of ln of f of x y is equal to Fourier transform of ln of r of ln of r of x y plus Fourier transform of ln of i of x y. Okay. And suppose this Fourier transform, let's call this a z of u v. Let's call the Fourier transform of this as r of u v. And let's say the Fourier transform of this is, for example, i of u v. Okay. Now, then let us process, let us process z u v by a filter h u v right i'll tell you i'll tell you what <coughs> what kind of characteristics this filter has but right now for the time being just just assume that there's some h of u v which is some frequency response of the filter now processing this will mean that you just multiply h u v right on both sides so you get into h of u v is equal to r u v into h u v plus I U V into H U V. Okay, and we will see what kind of characteristic this uh, this X should have. But for the time being, right? Let's simply say that right, we have done the processing. Now let's do the following, right? <clears throat> let's call this as S U V. Okay, suppose right, this is S U V. Now taking the Fourier inverse or taking the inverse Fourier transform. Take the inverse Fourier transform now. Now that right, we have done we have done the processing. Now taking the inverse Fourier transform will mean that you will get let's say S of X comma Y is equal to Fourier inverse of S of U V, right? Where you know S of U V, as we indicated before, is simply the quantity here. Okay, and this in turn will be equal to Fourier inverse of your R U V into H U V plus Fourier inverse of I U V into H U V. Right. Therefore, you'll have S of X comma Y. Let's say the Fourier inverse of this. Let's in, uh, indicate this as R dash of X Y. And let's call this as I dash of X Y. Now we are still uh, right, and uh, you should kind of note that you know, you know that but we took a natural logarithm right in order to arrive at all of this. Therefore, it right, we need to kind of do the do the you know inverse operation in order to go back to the original domain. In order to go back to the original intensity domain, in order to go back to the original intensity domain, original intensity domain okay 
we need to do right exponential of, of this quantity because at the time we took natural logarithm so, so we should raise these quantities to an exponential which is why it's called homomorphic right so so it's kind of what we what we did right at the beginning right when you're, you're applying a similar operation right the, the inverse of it in a sense in order to be able to go back so e power sxy is equal to e raised to r dash xy plus i dash xy and this will can this can split as e raised to r dash xy into e raised to e raised to i dash xy or we can rewrite this as some let's say let's call this as uh, okay what do we want to call this okay let's say that right this is our g of xy and this is equal to r naught of xy suppose we call this is r naught this quantity is r naught this quantity is i naught into i naught of xy okay so now what we observe is g of xy now okay and uh, since you have kind of say done this kind of a processing of course you know we don't get to get to see these individually but then having having right done this kind of processing is equivalent to right doing something like this which in turn yields you g of xy so g of xy is what you will what you will see now the hope is that g of xy will capture right uh, will, or will capture reflectance and would have and would have taken care of the right, illumination component in the sense that it should have it should, it should okay this should look look uniform okay close to being uniform now all of this hinges upon what this guy does right so all of this depends upon what was this huv okay that we have, that we have used okay so in order to understand right what this huv looks like okay this is a kind of a standard filter okay of this oh, this homomorphic filter and the filter uh, filter characteristic the frequency characteristic so this filter right can be drawn like this so this is huv okay and uh, let's say suppose i call although this is a 1d axis let me call this as u square plus v square okay and the way this takes values is that it starts from some gamma l and then goes all the way up to gamma h okay and uh, somewhere here it right, is some quantity called d naught okay, which again i'll explain what it is and uh, and this h of u v the expression for h of u v okay, looks as follows this is gamma h minus gamma l okay this is a standard homomorphic filter of used okay, into Uh, into okay, I don't know what is happening. Let's see. Into one minus e raised to minus root u square plus v square by d naught okay, plus gamma l plus gamma l. Therefore, h of zero comma zero which is 0 comma 0 right if you substitute 0 comma 0 u is equal to 0 v is equal to 0 then this goes away and you get gamma l okay which is the point here this is gamma l and then when you do h of infinity comma infinity that means that very high frequencies this goes away you get gamma h minus gamma l plus gamma l, therefore you get gamma h right so, so at high frequencies you hit you hit this gamma h the low frequency at h of 0 comma 0 right this is 0 comma 0 so yeah so this root u square plus v square so let's just call this as zero at zero right you've got gamma l now oh there is also one c here which i forgot it okay, is minus c times okay c times root of uh, u square plus v square by d naught now the role of this d naught right is such that now for example right i mean if you notice here okay when when this when this root u square plus v square equals d naught right so there's an expression when this equals d naught, then you get one minus one minus e raised to minus c. Okay, now the values of gamma h, gamma l, and uh, c, uh, now the values of gamma h and gamma l are typically chosen as typical values. These are again typical for a homomorphic filter. Typical values are, okay, are gamma uh, l is equal to 0.5. Okay, gamma h is equal to is equal to two. Okay, and uh, c is equal to minus of or c equal to 0 0.5. Okay, now if you if you kind of plug in these values, right, what you will realize is that 
when when root u square plus v square equals d naught at the time you get 1 minus e raised to minus c and if you put c equal to 0.5 and then you have if gamma h equal to 2 and then gamma l is equal to 0.5 gamma l is equal to 0.5 you solve this okay what you will realize is that when when root u square plus v square is equal to d naught the gain is about 1 the gain is approximately 1 okay after that of course then it will start to increase is approximately 1 okay now okay so it actually means that at this point that you have you have approximately a gain of 1 okay now this uh, right, d naught is some kind of a lever okay d naught is some kind of a handle right which you have so it uh, so what this actually means is that i mean you know if you if you choose your if you choose your you know uh, kind of d naught to be to be large right so a large d naught Okay, so again, right, D naught is uh, D naught is something like a hyperparameter. You can choose it. A large D naught implies okay, implies a slow rise. Okay, slow rise because it's one minus e raised to minus uh, the exponential, right? So slow rise and hence and hence attenuation of and hence attenuation of low frequency components. Okay, rather more more attenuation of low frequency components. Okay, a small d naught, on the other hand, d naught implies a quick rise, a quick rise, and hence less attenuation of, and hence less attenuation. Attenuation of low frequency components of of lower frequencies of the of lower frequencies. Okay, so 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 in a sense, right? D naught has to be so D naught is typically fine tuned for an example for for typically fine tuned for a given example. It's typically fine tuned for a given example. Okay, so in order to see appreciate, right? So, so in order to appreciate uh, this, uh, okay. Now, what we can do is we can actually take a take a kind of look at a homomorphic filter you know, example. Let me just see that if I have one for you to one to show to you. Uh, okay, there we go. Homomorphic filtering example. So, if you see this, right? See this image. Okay, so right in this image, you notice that uh, that right on the left, okay, is an image that needs to be Compensated for illumination because the light source is very strong at this point. Its uh, its action is very strong, and then the intensity kind of fades away as you go away, right, from this side. And therefore, right, if you apply a homomorphic filter of the type right, that I just now explained, what you get is a filtered image, right, that looks that looks more or less uniformly illuminated. So this may not be a perfect kind of illumination composition, but it works very well. It is simple, and right, it can be fine tuned to work for work for you know a given example. Okay, so right, that is the that is the nature of homomorphic filter. Now, for those of you right who are interested in knowing what is the latest, okay, the latest is what are called adaptive adaptive histogram equalization algorithms, where you break down the image into see, different regions and then and then perform you know histogram equalization region wise in order to in order to right make the make the illumination more or less uniform across the image. There are again variants of that. There have been variants right that, that have that have uh, no, that have been advocated. What are called contrast limited adaptive histogram equalization and so on. So for those of you who are interested, right, you could actually look at look at those methods that are that are kind of most recent, right, and uh, which are still which are which are being used now in order to handle illumination variations inside an image. Now, now, right, so far as uh, image enhancement is concerned, right, we have we are, we are covered. What I would say, kind of, you know, low-level topics in the sense that we talked about change detection, we talked about thresholding, right? We talked about uh, we talked about segmentation, we talked about the clustering, right? And then we talked about noise filtering, we talked about illumination compositions. All these are kind of low-level tasks, right? Now, research-wise, if you try to see, okay, what kind of things are going on, right? One of the things that I thought I'd just highlight for you people is to appreciate as to what is going on on the say the search front, okay? I'm just going to show you. 
um, show you a few examples of what is called uh, of what is called you know in painting. So right in painting in a way right is is again an image enhancement uh, technique. But then right uh, it has to do with uh, filling up lost information. Right so the uh, so the idea is that idea is that right I mean if you have something like this see for example right in this case. In this case, right, uh, let me just go and go to the next slide. Okay, so for example, see this image, right, that you see on the left. Okay, this image is kind of, uh, you know, there's a lot of information that has been lost. Okay, maybe, maybe, right, I don't know, this because somebody stashed a photo inside the trunk for a long time. It forgot to, forgot to take a look at it. And therefore, when you take the image out, it has been attacked by, attacked by insects, roaches, and so on. And therefore, what you find is that there are several blotches and uh, streaks and all right on this image and uh, you would like to fill this information in a manner that after you fill it up right you're not able to make out that somebody has actually filled it up okay similarly the second image is again something right which which of course you know you know which has uh, which has kind of a different kind of degradation in the sense that there's a lot of running text right on this image and which is a little annoying right so enhancing the visual appeal of this image is equal to saying that can you fill up the text such that it can borrow from neighboring intensities Whatever are the scene intensities, intensities you can borrow from them so as to be able to give you a picture, right? Where you now which will which will be which will be you know which will be which will be without this text, right? So I, so both of these are both of these are in painting examples, and the whole idea behind behind you know in painting is to be able to is to be able to fill up lost lost intensity information. Now after you in paint, right? What you see is this kind of an image, and clearly, right? You can see that all intensities have been very nicely filled up. It is even hard to hard to even uh, you know uh, hard to know as to where the in painting has been done. Similarly, if you look at this image after you have filled in the text by borrowing from neighboring intensities, again you have only one image. Okay, you have only this this degraded version with you, and you are supposed to fill in these uh, fill in these blotches, right? And uh, again here, this text has to be filled in by borrowing from neighboring values. Okay, which it has been able to do very well. And some people might say might actually like this image rather than this. In fact, it is often seen in movies, right? In the beginning, when they try and scroll text on the scene, okay. Sometimes right, it's a little annoying, and then you would wonder, can somebody not remove that text for me? Okay, so in painting, can actually do that. So in painting is a typical image enhancement research problem. Okay, now I can show you a few more examples. Okay, it doesn't end with this. Okay, you can also you can also do a little kind of fancy things. Mm -hmm. See, for example, here is a guy, right, who is do doing a kind of uh, see bungee jumping. And if you want to show yourself as a brave guy, what you could do is you could paint the rope so that you know, it looks like the rope is simply not even there. Okay, so basically people even do it for fun. Okay, so so it gives uh, gives a gives a sort of a macho feeling, right? That yes, you know, I can do right, things like this. Now, yet another thing, right? That uh, that you could do in painting uh, that you know that we in our lab have done is what's called uh, what's called three D in painting. The earlier one that you saw was was actually two D in painting. In 3D in painting, what you have to do is you have to generate a point cloud. It's more like a structure, right? It's kind of it's kind of a 3D information. It's a point cloud, and the whole idea is that uh, you know if you've been to Hampi, right, which is a, which is a UNESCO heritage site uh, in India, right? if you go to Hampi, then you find that right, uh, you've got several of these uh, of these sculptures, right, that have been broken and uh, and broken in a manner, you know, you know that uh, you know, that that kind of that kind of that kind of takes away the sheen from those sculptures. See, for example, you know, if you see the sculpture, right, the whole head is gone, right? And the whole idea is that can you kind of fill in a missing information like that in order to be able to give maybe somebody a virtual walkthrough as to what the statue might have looked like, right? It's at, at the point, at some point in time when it was actually originally intact. Mm -hmm. Now, doing that is not easy because, you know, there's no neighboring information from which you can borrow in order to be able to fill this up, fill this point cloud. Therefore, right, you know, when we, when we actually, when we actually executed this project, right, as a, as a, as a DST project, so that what we did was we went around, right? Luckily, what happens is in Hampi, architects, you uh, know, the rocks like these or sculptures like that, you know, uh, like this, right, which are important. There are not, there is not just one, but there are many of them. For example, I right, look at this, the one at the right, right. There are at least two examples that I've shown here. There are many more like that, and and all these look very similar to the one, right, that has been, you know, you know uh, what has been vandalized. So now the idea is that you know you kind of construct 3D point clouds of these objects of these of these other other sculptures that you have with you, and what you do is you kind of uh, and then that information that 3D point cloud you port onto the one okay that is broken. So the point cloud for this guy is broken. So if you align these point clouds and use a tensor voting approach in order to be able to fill up this head right, then you can actually fill it up pretty pretty kind of see decently in order to be able to show up a reconstructed uh, reconstructed 3D structure. 
So this structure is called inpainted now. So right, this is an inpainted 3D structure, and you can see that right. I mean, you know, and you can see that it has a significant effect. Okay, and you can actually do, and you can actually do similar things even for let's say other objects. For example, here is a horse, okay, uh, which has been 3D inpainted, and then you know here is uh, here is actually you know a Narsimha statue whose shoulder was broken, right, and that shoulder has been reconstructed using again you know some kind of some kind of 3D painting. Right. So, so, so in a sense, right. So basically, 3D in painting is again something okay that uh, that that is very advanced in terms of see, research in the area of see, image enhancement. I just wanted to show this to you so that right, you get an idea that uh, you know, that image in that image enhancement is not just something that you can do at a low level. I mean, you can actually you can actually elevate it, right? Escalate these say, research challenges in order to solve some very hard problems, something like you know, 2D and 3D in painting and so on, which again are aimed at enhancing the visual appeal. But again, it's a subjective matter, for example, historians and and, uh, and the culture people it may not entirely agree with this. They may say that the original thing should have been, maybe it was something else, maybe right, we have not been able to able to see capture all the fine things that we would have liked to. So in that sense, there, could, there is again a notion of subjectivity here. But then the point is, right, instead of having broken statues, you can at least make an attempted, uh, you can at least make an, make an educated guess as to what might have been there and be able to reconstruct and then show to this world as to know how these things might have looked like.